before everything else, I'd like to express, express my joy and happiness that you have come here to make use of this place in order to study and practice the Dhamma. In short, the Dhamma is the thing which will allow us to make the most use of this opportunity of human life. As much as is possible, we will be able to make use of this human birth through the study and practice of Dhamma. If you feel that there is something lacking or missing in your lives, or if you feel that your happiness and peacefulness is less than complete, if this is so, then it will be quite easy for you to come to study and practice Dhamma. If you think that your life is perfectly and completely wonderful, that you are completely and totally satisfied with everything, that there are no problems, no difficulties, no frustration, no dukkha. If this is the case, then there is no point in you studying the Dhamma. At a minimum, we should at least take a look and check out our lives and see how much we are experiencing the following kinds of difficulties, how much the following things are making lives, our lives rough. These things are love, anger, hate, fear, worry, envy, jealousy, possessiveness, selfishness. How much are these things causing problems in our lives? This is something we ought to all take a look at. You ought to be able to make a little bit of a guess and see what life would be or what life is like when it is not disturbed by these things such as love, hate, fear, anger, jealousy, etc. How peaceful and blissful would life be free of these things? You ought to take a look at this also. If you are certain that you would like to have a life free of these disturbances, love, hatred, anger, fear, etc. If you are certain of this, then it will be very easy for you to study and practice the Dhamma. Take a look and see how difficult it is when a lovely object comes by. See how difficult it is to control oneself so we don't fall in love with that thing. Take a look and see the difficulties of this kind of self-control. When something hateful or ugly comes by, look and see how difficult it is very difficult or not very difficult to control the mind, for the mind to control itself so that one doesn't fall into hatred towards that thing. Or when something fearful comes by, how difficult is it to not be afraid? Or something that usually incites worry, how difficult is it to keep from worrying, to keep from being jealous, to avoid envy, 
possessiveness and these other mental difficulties. Dhamma is the knowledge and the way of practice which develops the mind, which trains the mind so that it can be free of all the lovely, hateful, fearsome, worrisome things. With the Dhamma, it is able to, the mind can master itself so that there is no love, no hate, no fear, no envy, jealousy, etc. If we look, we can see that in all living things, whether plants, animals, or human beings, there are some things which we call the sanchatayan in Thai or the instincts. These instincts are something that arise in all or that exist in all living things. They arise with the self <clears throat> the instinct of self or of egoism and then the instincts which protect the self, which protect the ego, the individual identity. And so the instincts dominate our lives. The instinct of finding food, the instinct of fleeing from dangers, the instinct to struggle and fight when necessary, and all the other instincts which allow for life, for the individual life to be maintained. If we look, we will see these instincts in all living things. And we will also see how difficult it is to control them. See how difficult it is to keep these instincts under control so that they do not lead to problems, so that they do not cause dukkha. You may not think that it is possible to control the instincts. However, Dhamma stands firm and asserts that it is very possible to control the instincts to control them in such a way that life is free of dukkha, is free of unsatisfactoriness and all problems. It is very, very important to understand that these things which we call the instincts are neutral. The instincts themselves are neutral. However, they can develop in two different ways or directions. The first direction, the most common one, is where they develop in the direction of defilement. This is because sati, banya, mindfulness and wisdom, are lacking. When mindfulness and wisdom are not present, the instincts are not kept under control and they develop in a defiled way. This leads to dukkha. But it doesn't have to be that way. If there is satipanya, mindfulness and wisdom, then the instincts can be mastered and controlled so that they do not lead in the direction of dukkha. Take, for example, egoistic feeling or feeling that there is an individual entity. If there is no mindfulness and wisdom, this feeling turns into selfishness. This selfishness is very defiled and leads to all sorts of problems in dukkha. But that's not necessary. If this basic egoistic feeling is kept within limits and bounds, then it can be developed 
in a direction of enlightenment, of bodhi. When the instincts, for example, this egoistic feeling, are, de- are preserved and developed in an enlightened way, then there is no dukkha and problems are avoided. This is very important to know that the instincts are in themselves neutral. It's a matter of whether they are out of control or in control, whether they develop in a defiled way or in an enlightened way. When we talk about the instincts, it leads us to think of or recall a system of practice which we call meditation, or in particular, anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing meditation that you have been learning and practicing during this retreat. Anapanasati is one method of mental development. It's the best method of mental development or meditation for controlling the instincts. Through anapanasati, sati, mindfulness, awareness, is developed. Wisdom, banya, is developed. Sampajanya, sometimes called clear comprehension, other times called wisdom in action. This is developed. And also samadhi, the one-pointed, focused mind, is developed. Through anapanasati, these four things, mindfulness, wisdom, wisdom in action, and the one-pointed mind, are developed enough to control the instincts. This is, this happens through the practice of anapanasati. So in this practice of learning to control the instincts so that they do not go in a defiled direction, but rather in an enlightened direction, we begin our study of Buddhism with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, with the sense, with the six sense organs. This is where we start our study. We start with the eyes and the sights, the forms that are seen, the ears and the sounds that are heard, the nose and odors that we smell, the tongue and tastes, which we taste, the body and the tactile sensations, and the mind and mental objects. There are these six inner sense organs and six external sense objects. They come in pairs. There are six pairs like this. These sense pairs, sense bases, external and internal and external, are where the problems of life arise. So we begin our study with these. Let's take the example of the eye and a form. There's the eye and a form. And then they come into relationship with each other. When that happens, consciousness arises. This is based on the eyes, so we call it eye consciousness. There's the eye, the form or sight that is seen. They come into relationship, and then eye consciousness arises. When these three things come together, we call that patsa, patsa, or contact. This contact 
It's very important. We have to be aware of it if we want to solve our problems. Through the practice of anapanasati, we develop mindfulness and wisdom so that they can be there at that point of contact. Every time one of these contacts arises, there is mindfulness of that contact and wisdom regarding it. And there will also be sampajanya, wisdom in action, right there. And the mind will be samadhi, one-pointed and clear regarding that contact. If these four things are present at the contact, whether it is eye contact, ear contact, nose, tongue, body, or mind contact, whichever one of these six kinds of contact, if there is sati, banya, sampajanya, and samadhi, then the instincts will develop in the direction of enlightenment. But if the contact occurs without mindfulness, without wisdom, without wisdom in action, and without a clear one-pointed mind, then the instincts will go in a defiled direction, leading to problems and dukkha. This is why we begin our study with the sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. I'd like to stress that this, at the moment of contact, when an external sense object strikes one of the internal sense organs, this is in a very important moment. It's a moment. This isn't a continuous, everlasting thing. But they are momentarily things that arise. These contacts happen from moment to moment. When there is a contact, if there is no mindfulness and wisdom, then the instincts, which are always sort of hanging around the mind, will lead the mind in a defiled direction towards greed, anger, and ignorance. But if there is mindfulness and wisdom, the instincts will not be able to do that, and then the mind will be able to develop in an enlightened way. For example, when something strikes the eye, and then there is eye contact. If mindfulness is lacking, if mindfulness isn't there at that moment of contact, then there will be a reaction of liking or disliking, of, a pleasant, of being pleased with or displeased with that sense contact and that sense object. When this happens, selfishness arises regarding this liking and disliking. And when there is this, this germ of selfishness, a seed of egoism, then it develops into greed or lust, anger and hatred, ignorance, stupidity, which lead us into dukkha and fill our lives with problems. However, if when something strikes the eye at that moment of eye contact, there is mindfulness governing, covering, controlling, dominating that eye contact, then it will bring wisdom to that contact, 
this wisdom will be able to function. It will be wisdom in action in order to prevent any problems from arising. Mindfulness will draw on the store of wisdom that has been gained through life and apply the necessary wisdom in that specific situation, that specific eye contact. And then problems will be avoided. The defilements of greed, anger, and ignorance will not arise. Now, if the mind doesn't quite have enough strength or energy to do this, then samadhi, the one-pointed, focused, unified mind, needs to be developed so that the mind has enough energy to be mindful and to apply wisdom to the situation. When these four things are covering the contact, then the mind continues to go and develop in, in an enlightened way, building and developing more and more wisdom and being more skillful in the use of these four things. You can observe that if there is no control of these moments of contact, or if take just one moment of contact, if there is no control of that contact, then the various defiled mind states will arise. Lust, greed, ignorance, these sort of things will arise toward that sense object. And when this happens, you can see very well for yourselves that it is dukkha. These things are unpleasant, they're no fun, they're unsatisfactory, and cause us endless problems. You can see this for yourself. However, at the moment of contact, if there is mindfulness, wisdom, applied wisdom, and one-pointedness, then these problems don't arise. Without these things, the instincts are out of control and lead in the direction of dukkha. When these four dhammas are working and functioning, then the contact does not lead to dukkha, and it is, it is free of dukkha, or we can say that dukkha is extinguished, which is what, and this is enlightenment. There are these two directions it can go. The key are these four dhammas, sati, banya, Sampajanya and Samadhi. Please remember these four things, these four Dhammas. Remember them. Develop them. Know them fully. Become as skillful and expert as you can in bringing these things into existence and using them in your lives in order to control all those sense contacts that arise. So remember these four things. Sati, mindfulness. Banya, wisdom. Sampajanya, wisdom in action. And Samadhi, the one-pointed, clear, unified mind. These four Dhammas are something that you need to know, you need to be able to cause, to bring them into existence and then be able to use them properly. So let's look at things, let's look at a contact that is lacking in the four dhammas of sati, panya, sampajanya, and samadhi. There's the sense contact. 
without these four governing dhammas to keep it in control, then we can say that it is an ignorant or stupid contact. It's stupid. There's no knowledge or wisdom brought into use. When there is a stupid contact, this will condition or cause an ignorant reaction of the mind to that contact. The mind will stupidly or foolishly like what's happening, dislike it, or be so confused that it doesn't know whether it should like or dislike. These three kinds of ignorant reaction are called vetana, or feeling. But we're using the English word feeling in a very specific way. Please do not confuse it with some of the other meanings of feeling. We're talking about this ignorant reaction of the mind to sense experience, liking, disliking, or confusion. This feeling, things don't stop with the feeling, with Vedana. Vedana conditions craving or desire, which is also ignorant, because we've got a string of ignorance conditioning stupidity, conditioning further stupidity. So we have this stupid desire or craving for the sense objects. This is conditioned by this feeling. The mind reacts. After it reacts, it starts desiring. It it wants to get what it likes. It wants to get rid of what it doesn't like. So this, this we call craving or desire. Once there is desire, this conditions attachment, upadana, upadana. Attachment is the feeling of the desirer, the one who craves. First there was desire, now there's the one who desires. Here we have the egoistic feeling is building. This too is ignorant. Attachment conditions where we have this I. There's the I who desires and craves to get or get rid of. This begins to build into a state which is called the condition we can call the condition of self, or it's the coming into existence, the becoming of the self. Here the self is just about complete. And then this finally conditions birth. Not birth from the mother's womb, but birth of the self, of the ego of the big fat I, which is attaching to all the things around it as me or as mine. And this self and all this possessiveness is completely and utterly dukkha. In everything that the mind, this egoistic mind that has arisen, In everything that it claims to be me, there is unsatisfactoriness. In everything that it attaches to as mine, there is dukkha. This is what happens when there is sense contact that lacks the four dhammas we've been talking about. Mindfulness, wisdom, wisdom in action, and the one-pointed mind. This points out the importance of developing these four dhammas and are able to avoid this ignorant development, this defiled progression which leads to dukkha. 
if you understand what's been said, then you will understand that birth doesn't just refer to what happens when we leave our mother's womb. That kind of birth is only material or physical birth. It is only the birth of the material elements that make up life or make up human life. But at that physical birth, the ego or the self or the soul, if we wish, has not yet been born. It is just physical birth. But as was described, there is an ignorant process, the defiled path, which leads to the birth of the self. It is only when the self is born that we can say that birth is complete, because then there is both physical birth and mental birth, birth of the body and birth of the self, then birth is complete. Now the thing about this self or soul that is born, that is very important to realize, is that it is an illusion. It is elusive or illusionary. There's nothing real about it. It's just a concept or a figment of the, in the mind. It's not real. So, the birth of the self or the soul that is different from physical birth, this is the problem. This is our problem. Because with this birth of the self or soul, then there is attachment. There is grasping and clinging to all sorts of things as me and as mine, which is purely illusion. None of this is real. If we genuinely understand the process leading up to this point, to the birth of the self, then we'll see that there is no real self involved. But this, this self is just a deluded concept or idea in the mind. Now this, the point leading up to that, you can see that patsa, the moment of contact, is the fork in the road. At patsa, there is the possibility of going in one of two directions. And it's the choice or the direction that one follows at that fork in the road which governs whether there will be dukkha or freedom from dukkha, whether there will be problems or not. At the moment of patsa, if there is no wisdom, mindfulness, wisdom in action, and one-pointedness, i.e. if there is ignorance, then the mind takes the path of dukkha, of defilement, and falls into states of mind such as lust, anger, and delusion. As this path is taken over and over again, it becomes a well-worn path. Each time this is, one goes past, goes in this direction, one becomes more and more familiar with it, which in, increases the odds of following this path later. So this, this tendency can develop to go in this ignorant direction. This tendency, this familiarity with ignorance, can develop to the point where it's a habit, the habit of stupidity. 
where mindfulness, wisdom, wisdom in action, and one-pointedness are missing. That's one fork in the road, the fork that leads to dukkha, or the direction. But the other path is the path of enlightenment. Rather than ignorance, it is governed by knowing and wisdom, by poti or bodhi, it is the enlightened way. And so at the moment of contact, of sense experience, then the mind doesn't fall into this egoistic grasping at things as I, as mine, and as myself. So there, this illusion of the self or soul does not arise. And then all the problems that are caused by this illusion do not arise as well. And so there are freedom, there is freedom from all these problems and freedom from dukkha. So get, come to study and understand the path, the fork in the road that happens at the moment of patsa or sense contact. Like to stress further the importance of contact, of this, this fork or split in the road. Observe in your own lives. Observe each and every day. Take today, for instance. For each of you, observe today how many times you come to this fork in the road. How many times do the, the, the sense contact happen for you today? How many times do you know? Find out how many times you come to this fork in the road. And then observe whether you go the right way or the wrong way. Observe this. Are the defilements, the mental defilements, are they just let go of, allowed to run out of control and drag the mind along in a way of greed, anger, hatred, fear, worry, and all these other unskillful mind states which lead to dukkha. Is this the way that is followed? Do we develop this familiarity with this defiled path? Does it become a habit, a tendency? If we look around us in the world, watching TV, reading the newspaper, whatever, we'll see that this path is the common one. This is the path that is most often followed in the world today. The defiled path where the instincts are out of control. But observe in your life this fork in the road. See how many times the wrong way is followed and how many times the right way is followed. See each time that this we that one comes to the path or to the fork in the path in one's mind. One chooses the defiled way or the enlightened way, where the four dhammas of mindfulness, wisdom, wisdom in action, and one pointedness are able to govern and master the instincts. So the mind goes in an enlightened way which leads to freedom from dukkha and ultimately the, the utter cessation of dukkha. So don't overlook these moments of contact, these sense experiences where that are happening who knows how many times each day. See them Today, how many time do they, times do they happen to you today? How many times does the mind go in the right direction and how many in the wrong? And then tomorrow and the day after, each and every day, 
see how many times you come to this fork in the road. And develop these four dhammas so that familiarity with the defiled path weakens and diminishes and one comes to follow the enlightened path more and more. See this in your own minds, in your own lives, today, now. Dhamma offers us two opportunities with which to use life. We've been talking about the first opportunity. That is whenever a sense object strikes one of the sense organs causing consciousness to arise. Whenever one of these sense objects catches the mind, the way to use that opportunity is for there to be mindfulness, wisdom, wisdom in action, and one-pointedness at that moment of contact in order to govern and control that sense experience. These four things, we can call them four comrades, four Dhamma comrades. Wherever they go, these four comrades have to go together. If one is missing, it's like they're all missing. We need to develop all four of them so that each is sufficient at each moment of sense contact so that there is mindfulness of the contact so that enough wisdom has been developed and stored for that contact to be understood that wisdom in action draws on that store of knowledge and applies the exact wisdom that is necessary to deal with the situation. And where the one fight, where one pointedness provides the strength and power for the mind to deal with the situation, with each sense contact as it arises. This is the first opportunity of living which Dhamma offers us to make use of all the sense experiences in a wise, enlightened way by applying the four comrades of Dhamma that we have been developing and continue to develop in the practice of Anapanasati. This is the first opportunity. Life gives us a second opportunity in which to study and practice Dhamma. These sense contacts are not happening all the time. In between them are moments where we can take, make use of the second opportunity. We can call this second opportunity vipassana, insight, which means clear seeing, seeing things as they really are. So in these moments when there is no sense contact to make use of, then it is a time for vipassana. In vipassana, reality is examined. It is observed until it is seen clearly, until the truth is realized regarding this reality. This is not a matter of rationally or intellectually convincing oneself of anything nor is it a matter of blind belief in the doctrines of one sect or another. Rather, it is direct intuitive realization of truth, of reality. 
This is what vipassana is about. The, the truth of the revealed in vipassana is anicca dukkha or anicang dukkang anatang. These three characteristics of all conditioned reality. Everything which has arisen in this world due to causes of any kind or any sort are subject to anijang, impermanence, change or flux. All conditioned things are in a process of ceaseless change. Because of this, all these conditioned things are unsatisfactory. They are dukkha. They can never satisfy in any way. They can never fulfill desires or delight or give us what we want. So they are dukkang. And all these conditioned things, which includes everything in the universe except for one thing, that one thing is Nibbana, or in Sanskrit, Nirvana. Except for Nirvana or Nibbana, all things are conditioned. And all these conditioned things are impermanent and unsatisfactory. In addition, they are anatta. In them is no permanent individual entity which can be labeled a self or a soul. These three things, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and non-self, are the subjects of vipassana. These are the meditation objects of the clear seeing of reality as it truly is. So in those moments between sense contacts, it's a chance to make use of vipassana. And as these three characteristics of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not-self are realized, we can go deeper and deeper in understanding and wisdom. These three characteristics can be summarized as sunyata, sunyata, voidness or emptiness. Now this voidness doesn't mean physical voidness like in outer space or in a vacuum. We're talking about spiritual emptiness, meaning the emptiness of all egoistic and selfish thoughts. The emptiness, the freedom from, the voidness of any ideas of I, mine, myself. This is sunyata. It's when impermanence and unsatisfactoriness and non-self are realized in a more profound and penetrating way. And then to go even deeper still is to realize tatata, tatata, or suchness thusness, the isness of everything. In Thai, chen nan eng. That's the way things are. They're just this way, they're not any other way. Just like this, that's all there is. So in those moments between sense contact, it's the opportunity for vipassana to realize that all conditioned things are impermanent, anicca, that they are unsatisfactory, dukkha, 
and that they are completely void, completely lacking of any self, ego, or soul, that is anatta. To penetrate these three is to realize sunyata, the emptiness of self, of I, me, mine, myself, of ego, the voidness of soul. And to go even deeper is to see datata, chenan eng. It's just this, nothing else, nothing more. This is the way it is, just this, just thus. So this is the second opportunity which Dhamma offers us, second way to use life. Using these two opportunities, life is full. There's something to do all the time. And by using the Dhamma in these two ways, in these two wise and skillful ways, then the path of defilement leading to dukkha, where the instincts are out of control, doesn't happen. Instead, what is happening is through the realization of sunyata, of voidness, that egoistic instinct, the self-instinct, that arises sometime after physical birth. This is lessened, weakened, it begins to dissipate. It arises less often, and when it arises, it's not as big and strong. And when we see this more and more, Everything is begun to see as ta ta ta, chen nan eng, just this. And when we see it as just this and nothing more, there's no more applying these egoistic labels, distinctions, identifications, and attachments to things. They are seen as they really are, free of I, me, and mine. And this is to develop the instincts in the enlightened way, in a way that is free of dukkha, free of pain and problems. There are these two opportunities which Dhamma offers us. In one, we use the four comrades developed through Anapanasati to control and govern the sense contacts. And then in the other, we use vipassana, which is also anapanasati, to examine reality and see things as they really are, as anicca, dukkha, anatta, as sunyata, voidness, and as tatata, suchness, thusness, or in Thai, Chen Nan Eng. I'd like you to look at the value of Tata Ta or suchness a little more. Whether you see Tata Ta internally within the mind and body as you experience them from moment to moment, or whether you see Tata Ta suchness in the objects of nature that are external. No matter whether you see Tata Tai internally or externally, this seeing of things as they really are, as just this, just thus, is to free oneself of dualistic thinking. Usually, the deluded mind, the egoistic selfish mind is seeing things as this and that, as good and bad, good and evil, cutting reality up into two pieces according to the judgments, 
this, and this dualistic thinking can be done away with by understanding and seeing da ta da the thusness of things. If this problem of seeing things as good as or evil, this dualistic way of approaching the world, is illustrated in the first page of the book of Genesis of the Christian Bible. There it talks about the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God forbid Adam and Eve to eat. This fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When Adam took the bite, that was to begin and see things in a dualistic way, to see things as good and as evil. This is the arising of all man's problems. This is original sin, this dualistic thinking, which can be done away with through the realization of da-ta-da. When one perceives everything as just this, just the way they are, then there is no more this judging as good and bad, right and wrong, pleasant and unpleasant, even to the point where there is no more judging as male and female. When these judgments these attachments to things as this or that, as good and bad, as losing and winning, as getting and and giving. When all these distinctions, all this dualistic ignorance is let go of, then all the problems that are caused by them disappear. This can happen through the perception and realization of Thusness, da ta ta, chen nan eng. Finally, the fruit of seeing da ta ta is in not attaching to ourselves as the doer or the done to. When there is an action, there is no attachment to the one who does the action or the one who is acted upon. These distinctions disappear. And in this way, there is no winning and no losing, or no profit and loss, getting and losing. Taking advantage of or being taken advantage of. Receiving the benefit or losing the benefit. All these dualistic distinctions disappear. This is the value of da-ta-da. They allow us to see things, or da-ta-da, the seeing things as they are, without the problems that arise from dualistic thinking, without the dukkha that is caused by egoistic ignorance. The last thing we'd like to say is that through the realization of da-ta-ta, there's nothing strange anymore. There's nothing marvelous or wonderful or weird or strange left in the world. Everything is seen as just that, just this, as it is, da-ta-ta. So when they they go to the moon, we just see it as children's play, just playing with toys. Nothing special, nothing strange. Just da ta da. All the things that happen that we used to get excited about, that we get excited about, agitated about, worried about, they're just seen as they are. Nothing strange, nothing weird. Just da ta da. This is the way to live in a balanced and calm, centered in Dhamma. And so, this is how 
how we live in the world, or we live correctly all the time, from moment to moment, constantly. There are two kinds of time. There are the times or the moments when we meet up with sense objects, where various sense objects collide with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. This we can call the world. This is meeting the world, being in the world. This is one kind of time which we have talked about. The other kind of time is when these, the, sense, the senses are not functioning. There's a moment of respite when we're not meeting up with the world. This is the opportunity for vipassana. So to, to use both times fully and well is to practice dhamma all the time and to live in a wise way which is free of dukkha. So finally, to live like this is to be free of problems and be free of dukkha. On the physical bodily level, there's nothing afflicting or harming us. On the mental level, there's nothing afflicting or causing problems. And on the level of mindfulness and wisdom, on the spiritual level, there is also no affliction and no dukkha, no problems. This is the fruit practicing Dhamma from moment to moment. And when it's like this, when life is lived this way, there is a kind of bliss and calmness and coolness and peacefulness that our vocabulary cannot describe. We don't have a word for it. We drunkenly call it happiness. We apply this word which we usually use with cheap thrills <laughs> and various coarse kinds of pleasure. We go and apply this word happiness to something which is very subtle and sublime the result of living according to Dhamma. So we can use this word happiness in speaking about living on the spiritual level according to Dhamma. But if we use it, please understand that this happiness is not the happiness of the senses of ordinary living. If we want to use this word, understand that it's a kind of happiness that is above happiness, beyond happiness. It transcends happiness. This is what happens when one lives according to Dhamma, when one is free of dukkha, when dukkha has been extinguished. Finally, I hope that all of you are benefiting from the practice of Anapanasati, that through this practice, through this development, you are building, strengthening, and increasing the four Dhamma comrades of Sati, mindfulness, awareness, Panya, wisdom, or knowing, Sampajanya, wisdom in action, wisdom being used to meet a specific situation, and Samadhi, the one-pointed, unified, in mi unified, unified mind. That these four comrades will be used to to keep the instincts within line, so that whenever there is sense contact, that these four comrades will. Able, enable us to deal with the problems of life which arise at sense experience. The arising of the mental defilements when the, <clears throat> when the instincts are out of control can be met with through these four comrades.
So I hope that you are developing these things and benefiting from your practice of anapanasati. On this note, I request that we finish today's talk. Thank you.